Welcome to lecture 13 of Networks, Friends, Money and Bots. Now we have been talking quite a bit about social and economic networks. And we have seen that the predictive power of some of these models can be quite poor because it is very difficult to model human beings. For example, all those Demand functions and utility functions we've been talking about assume that uh, human beings will act as a rational agent. But pretty much no human being is actually a rational agent. So the economists may say, uh, gee, um, human beings are not nice. Uh, they do not behave according to my model. But in reality, you have to face the fact that um, uh, a lot of these assumptions simply do not hold. So what kind of model can be tractable and still have predictive power in economics? Uh, I don't know. But in the upcoming few lectures, we'll be turning our attention back to technological networks. Similar to the Qualcomm and Google stories back in lectures 1, 2, and 3, especially in lecture one. And we're going to see the predictive power uh, to be much, much higher because it's a lot easier to model um, machines that uh, we actually designed. So we're going to move into a few lectures, starting with the basic principles of the internet. And then we'll go to talk about routing. How does traffic go through the internet? So that's the plan, and therefore this is going to be a long lecture. It's sort of like as long as lecture four, if you remember how long that was. Because we have to talk about two things. One is give a brief introduction of the internet design principles, and then we we'll talk about the specifics of routing protocols. So this lecture serves two major purposes. Now, it is very tricky to talk about the historical evolution of technologies such as the Internet. Part of that was based on design, and we would love to think that the historical evolution all follow from design. But there's a lot of influence from simply historical legacy of accidents, okay, ranging from some very important principles such as backward compatibility. Your new design have to be able to be compatible with all the previous generations, such as incremental deployability. You can deploy this new software or hardware uh, in an incremental way and still start to see the benefits without turning the whole network upside down overnight, such as economic incentives. You have to provide the right incentives, as we saw last lecture, to all the parties involved. But there are also other sort of silly reasons like lack of coffee in one morning when somebody in IETF, one of the major internet standardization body, wanted to argue for or against a case. Okay, Or political and economic reasons of uh, supporting or vetoing certain standards. So there's a lot of historical legacy of simple uh, accidents. So it is even more amazing to see that the internet had thrived so well. There must be some robustness, not just in the internet itself, but also in the evolution of the internet. So here's a very brief history of what we have gone through. Back in the 1950s and before, we were all looking at what's called a PSTN. It's got a funny name, a plain simple telephone uh, network. Okay. And it is what we call a circuit switch. We'll soon be contrasting circuit switch with a uh, packet switch. Okay. Then in the 1960s, researchers have started look at packet switch network, which is a lot more efficient when you have bursty arrival and departures of traffic. And this culminated in 1969's creation of the ARPANET. ARPA stands for um, Advanced Research Project Agency. 
It is one of the U.S. federal funding agencies funding fundamental research and their following developments. So it was called ARPANET. There were many important milestones since '69. One of which、uh, highlight is the invention of TCP/IP protocol, okay, transmission control internet. Uh, transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. It started out as a single protocol, and then it later split into TCP and IP. We'll soon be talking about TCP and IP in great detail today and in the next lecture, as well as the interplay between the two. And TCP/IP was really a special case of a general principle of a protocol stack. That is layered. What is a protocol? Well, a protocol basically is a sequence of computation and communication to control the behavior of a network. Layered stack of protocols provides a modularization that can divide and conquer a big problem into smaller pieces. And then in 1985, the Evolution of ARPANET turned into what's called NSFNet. NSF stands for National Science Foundations. is another U.S. federal funding agency、uh, of fundamental research. It took over the development of the internet, which by that point has indeed developed into a network of networks. Okay. Along this long history. Actually, not that long. Maybe you know, fifty、uh, years of、uh, evolution. There were many important figures,、uh, such as the so-called forefathers of the internet, or sometimes people call eight or twelve fathers and one mother of the internet.、Uh, but no single person sort of invented one monolithic object called the internet. The、okay, internet really is interworking of a network of networks. Okay. Your computer connected through the Ethernet. My phone's connected through the cellular network. Some routers in between. It's a network of networks. And then in 1990 or 89, depending on which event you count,、uh, the World Wide Web was invented. Now it is very important to have some kind of user interface UI that is friendly. And World Wide Web started doing that with a protocol、uh, to do. Uh, the right user interface, followed by a browser, followed by a portal. Okay, browser like Netscape、uh, back in the mid '90s, portal like Yahoo,、right? and other services such as eBay, Amazon, Hotmail. If you recognize some of these, like Hotmail,、uh, it means that、um, you are as old as I am. Uh, or uh, older, but some of these clearly stayed on、uh, over the last、uh, almost twenty years, such as eBay and Amazon.、Right? One of the first、uh, set of、uh, most important portals is Yahoo.、Okay. So by nineteen ninety four, ninety five, the internet has taken off commercially. Okay, the government decommissioned the NSF net. The commercial interest. Uh, took that into、uh, ridiculously fast、uh, exponential growth.、Okay. Now we are in the age of、uh, 2012, and it's projected by 2020 there will be six times more connected devices to the internet than there are people on this planet. So that is an incredible, if you count all the way to 2020, let's say, okay, an incredible half a century. Of development. Now, this course is not a technology history course, so we're going to quickly switch into the three fundamental ideas behind the design of the internet.、Okay. These are not specific artifacts of engineering, but they are ideas, and very powerful ideas. The first one I highlight is packet switching. Now the basic idea, as in many powerful ideas, are actually simple once you state them in the right way. It says that if the users don't require dedicated resources, okay, no need for dedicated resources, then don't dedicate resources, share them. 
When we say a user in this lecture, at least a user is equivalent to a session, or what I call a simple session. What is a simple session? Well, a session, for example, here's you, right, holding your phone, and、uh, here is a YouTube server in Google's cloud. It goes through actually many, many hops, as we'll see in a minute.、Okay. But actually, once when you pull something, okay, whether it's a video or a web page. Oftentimes, it put other things. For example, a server with advertisement, okay, or a server with、uh, cookies or other control messages, okay. So, when we say there's a session or a user, we really mean just the primary session, if you will.、Okay. Often, when you download a movie, a stream a movie, it actually comes from many different servers. The one-hour movie, let's say, actually could come from ten different servers with different segments. We ignore that. We say, well, in that case, just say there's ten sessions. Okay. So, for us today, a user is a session. It's a simple session. It's also a unicast session, meaning that there is only one source and one destination. Later, we'll see one source but n destinations, all requiring the same content at about the same time. That's multicast, but today it's a simple unicast session. Now, before the early '60s, was the phone networks,、uh, which was another remarkable, remarkable invention in human history, and it was circuit switched. What does that mean? It means that from this source to this destination, we use usually use S and T to denote these、uh, two nodes. Inside there is a network. You're going to establish a whole tube, okay, a circuit between the source and the destination, and that's only for you, okay. For example, blah blah blah. I'm talking, right? It goes over there. The say digitally encoded、uh, signals of my voice, okay. And you say blah blah blah. It comes back. When I have nothing to say, you have nothing to say. Silence. Now this tube is still. Reserved for us, whether we are using it or not. And once we're done with this phone call, you have to tear down the session, just like we have to establish it at the time of、uh, initiating the conversation. Now you can probably already smell something good about this. For example, quality guarantee, because no one else is sharing this pipe with you. But you probably also sense something not so good. For example, what if I'm not using it? And It takes quite a lot of effort to establish a circuit and then tear it down. So people start in 1960s start wondering, what if we do something called packet switching? There are three smart ideas behind packet switching. Number one, let's cut this message into smaller granularities called packets. Okay, instead of thinking the whole user or session as one logical unit, I'm going to think of this as many logical units. Each packet could be quite small. For example, you know, a hundred kilobytes. Okay. And the different packets can now actually go through a different path in this network. Okay. So you can have multiple paths for the same session. Okay. Some of the packets go this path. Some of the packets go this. Some go this path. And furthermore, each link along each path. Is actually possibly shared by many sessions. Okay, so here's one link. This session go through this link, taking up some of the capacities. There could be another session going through this link, taking up another part of this capacity.、Okay. So what's so good about shared path and shared links and multiple path? Okay, each link shared by multiple sessions. Each session may take multiple path. We'll see. Now here's first a pictorial illustration of that. Graph A is circuit switching. Now, the physical manifestation of a circuit can be、uh, different. For example, a typical one is you get one time slot, I get another time slot. You get yours time slot, I get my slot time slot. So even when you have nothing to say, your time slot is still yours. Nobody is using it. Another one is frequency domain. Okay, you get this part of the spectrum. I get that part of the spectrum. Okay, 
and I will have a dedicated tube between my source and destination. Graph B, in contrast, is a packet switched. Okay. These little blue things are the packets, okay. uh, and also these uh, white ones. Okay. So some packets traverse one path, some tra packets traverse a different path. And a link, for example, this link can be shared by multiple, in this case, two sessions. Now this actually is a debate that runs far and deep. We are talking about circuit versus packet switching. Back in lecture one, we talked about orthogonal versus non-orthogonal allocation of radio resources in wireless cellular networks. For example, uh, FDMA or TDMA versus uh, a practical CDMA, even though in ideal situation, CDM is also orthogonal. We will talk about client server versus P2P in lecture, I guess, 15 coming up. Okay. We will talk about local storage in a dedicated machine versus a shared and rented cloud in lecture 16. We will talk about in lecture 18, contention-free centralized scheduling in Wi-Fi versus the more often used random access in Wi-Fi. All these comparison A versus B represent a tension between a dedicated or orthogonal versus a shared or non-orthogonal resource allocation in a network. So which one to pick, A or B? Well, to those who love circuit switching or in general orthogonal and dedicated resource allocation, you say, uh, it's got a guarantee of quality, okay? Because nobody is fighting with you. As opposed to in packet switching, uh, you really have no guarantee unless you impose a certain particular resource allocation mechanisms on top of the basic features, as we'll see in lecture 17 for video traffic. But in general, what you have is what the internet community um, jokingly, I guess, called the best effort. The best effort here refers to really no guarantee on effort. Okay, I will try my best. So when you you know say, can you please help me this? You know, depending on who's answering that question, if you know. Bob says, I'll try my best, and you know the top person Bob is, you may say, gee, that really means that you're not going to really try uh, hard at all. And indeed, the internet, uh, at least in IP layer, does not provide any guarantee on the amount of effort it will provide. Part of that is because it really cannot guarantee uh, by the design in that layer. So they call that best effort. That doesn't imply best result. So you may say, I love guarantee of quality, so I love circuit switching. On the other hand, those who like packet switching would uh, probably come up with the top two reasons being the following. Number one, ease of connectivity. I do not have to uh, establish one before I can talk. Okay, I do not have to tear it down. I do not have to maintain the status of the circuit. I can easily establish connectivity. Number two is scalability. We have briefly touched upon this, and in the coming lectures, we'll be talking a lot about scalability in various kinds of technology networks. In this case, scalability refers to the efficiency gain in packet switching. There are actually two distinct types of gains. Number one is called statistical multiplexing. It says the following, if Alice traffic look like this and Bob's traffic look like that, then if I put them together, I'll get some traffic like this. Right? So I can have this pipe actually serve two users. Now, of course, you say, well, gee, the peak and the valley actually are exactly complementary between Alice and Bob. No wonder you can do that. Sure, this is extreme case. But imagine, in many cases, if you can put 10,000 users together, okay? And they fluctuate in their traffic demand. Uh, you will have some gain of uh, the flavor of statistical multiplexing. 
But what if they indeed all peak at the same time? Then you need something like time-dependent pricing to smoothen some of that out and leverage the resulting statistical multiplexing gain. That's what we uh, mentioned early on in the last lecture. All right. So when would this be useful? It would be useful if there's a lot of dynamic traffic on demand with a lot of burstiness. If this traffic keeps on going, okay, even though there's some up and downs, uh, it just keeps on going. Then you may just say, well, let me just waste a little bit of resource and give this pipe to it. But if the traffic is like this, come and then go, come and it goes. Another one is also like that. This is bursty traffic. Okay, when it arrives, then it will arrive with quite a bit of demand, and then it will be silent for a period of time, then it will come back up again. For bursty traffic, if you give a dedicated pipe, then you are guaranteed to lose a lot of efficiency. All these slots are gone. The resources are not being fully utilized. Okay, so for dynamic on-demand scenario with bursty traffic, you want packet switching to help you with a statistical multiplexing gain. Number two reason for efficiency is resource pooling. This one takes a little bit more effort. In the homework problem, you will do a little exercise. Actually, to illustrate resource pooling is even important for telephone networks. But you can intuitively understand, if you go to the cashier checkout counter of your favorite, your country's favorite uh, uh, supermarket, you know, say Walmart, right? So there are, say, three queues, okay, three cashiers. And if there are three separate queues, a lot of times you say, gee, you know, the other queues are moving so fast, my queue is moving so slow, which might be true or just perception. But you may say, oh, this is not fair. Whereas if there is actually one queue to all of them, just one queue, and everybody just queue up here, and whenever there is available cashier, the next one can go there, here, here, or here. Okay. And then you may feel that, Ah, this is more fair because you know even if I'm in the wrong queue, it's all right. So similarly, you can say that if there's a certain capacity, okay, I say this uh, is actually a collection of five cashier counter, five cashier counter, five cashier counters. And if you divide them, divide the pipe without allowing them to share the queue, then you may actually have a fully occupied uh, set of counters here and start turning away people are making them wait even though when the other sets are actually have vacant cashier counters okay, so by uh, pooling resource together you gain some efficiency all right so as you can see this is when you allow uh, a multiple path and this is when you allow shared links these two features of packet switching lead to two different root causes for the efficiency and thereby scalability afforded by packet switching. Now, in the end, what wins? The guarantee of quality or the ease of connectivity plus scalability and efficiency? As you might guess, the ease of connectivity and the scalability and efficiency won the day because it pays to at least have a large network to start out with. And then let's worry about quality of service with other methods. So packet switching won the day, although that wasn't entirely clear, even all the way to the late 90s.